They're not going to kill you or rape you or maybe even take your money, but they're going to manipulate the situation, make you look bad or use you in some way. Something bad's going to happen. And if you sense that, people have a sense that something is wrong with somebody, you walk away. You don't fight these guys because they're intra-species predator, a human that is a predator on other humans. They're not really attuned to your feelings. They don't really care about your feelings. Uh, really, ultimately, the world uh, surrounds, uh, surrounds them. Uh, psychopaths are also very charming. They're very manipulative, especially when they're in a crowd, especially when they're in company. Uh, but behind the scenes, when they're alone with you, they can be very, very controlling. Sometimes, but not always aggressive, but psychologically controlling as well, okay? It's hard to look at the, the, the actual behavior of a psychopath and say, that thing is psychopathic or not. Because psychopaths will come to the rescue of people. Can I help you up, ma'am? They can see the outward behaviors and they just can mimic it to get along. But fundamentally, they don't feel it. We all know about the uh, the psychopath's enhanced killer instinct, their, uh, their finely tuned vulnerability antenna. But uh, it may uh, surprise you to know that there are some situations in which psychopaths are actually more adept at saving lives uh, than they are at taking them. So let me give you uh, an example of what I mean by that, okay? You've got a train speeding out of control down a track. Um, and it's going to plough into five people on the line. You are standing behind a very large stranger on a footbridge above that track. The only way to save the people is to heave the stranger over. While the scoring lives is five to one, one's choice of action appears far trickier. Now, why should that be? Well, the reason it turns out all boils down to temperature, okay? It presents what we might call uh, a personal dilemma. Uh, it involves the emotion centre of the brain, known as the amygdala, uh, the circuitry of hot empathy, um, what we might call the feeling of feeling what another person is feeling. Now, psychopaths, just like most normal members of the population, have no trouble at all with case one. They flick the switch and the train diverts accordingly, killing just the one person instead of the five. But this is where the plot thickens. Quite unlike normal members of the population, psychopaths also experience little difficulty with case two. Psychopaths, without a moment's hesitation, are perfectly willing to chuck the fat guy over the rails if that's what the doctor orders. Now, moreover, this difference in behavior has a distinct neural signature. There are a number of areas in the brain that are very important in social decision making and moral attitudes. And there's a more primitive part of the brain that deals with emotion uh, called the limbic system. In the limbic system, there is a small organ uh, called the amygdala that registers emotion, but particularly has a, an ability to recognize when somebody else out there has a fearful face or is in a state of fright or, or upset. The interesting thing about the uh, kind of cold-hearted uh, murderers is that their amygdalas don't function properly the way ours does, and they may recognize dimly that so-and-so out there uh, is afraid, but they don't have the concern that you or I would, like, let's say if we saw a crying kid in a department store who probably got separated from his mother. They would recognize it, but able, they would take advantage of the child, pretend to take it to the information booth, you know, to get it reconnected with its mom, and then kidnap the kid <laughs> or something like that. Another important area is the front part of the brain called the orbitofrontal uh, cortex. That area is involved in moral decision making, figuring out what's right versus what's wrong that we learn as we grow up and are instructed by our parents and our teachers. So if that area of the brain is not operating at full tilt, it may be possible then to carry out an act which would be repugnant and very much against the law. But think of the orbitofrontal cortex as kind of braking system, which if it's operating, will put the brakes on a thought or a desire that may have preceded it, that I, I like to kill that son of a bitch, or I, I wanna take that kid and kidnap him and, you know. Then one thinks of the consequences, oh my God, I, I, I've eaten cheese sandwiches in jail for the rest of my life, I won't do that, I won't go there. But if that cortex is not operating, the person may just go ahead and do it. Uh, the pattern of brain activation in both normal people and psychopaths is is identical on the presentation of the impersonal moral dilemma, but radically different when things start to get a bit more personal. Imagine that I were to hook you up to a brain scanner, a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, and were to present you with those two dilemmas, okay? What would I observe as you went about trying to solve them? 
well, at the precise moment that the nature of the dilemma switches from impersonal to personal, I would see the emotion center of your brain, your amygdala, and related brain circuits, the, the medial orbitofrontal cortex, for example, light up like a pinball machine. I would witness the, the moment, in other words, when emotion puts its money in the slot. But in psychopaths, I would see precisely nothing. And the passage from impersonal to personal would slip by unnoticed because that emotion neighborhood of their, their brains, that emotional zip code, has a neural curfew. And that's why they're perfectly happy to chuck that fat guy over the side. Orbital cortex and the amygdala. Orbital cortex is involved in inhibiting your behavior. Now the amygdala, on the other hand, really causes behavior. And normally they're in balance, they inhibit each other. Now in a psychopath, they're both turned off, so they don't inhibit each other and they don't regulate it. So the normal balance of animal drives and your social interactions, your morality, are not right. That's never right. I mean, there's a time for aggression. There's a time for killing even. There's a time for sex. And part of it is how the rest of the brain is able to tell your orbital cortex the social context is correct now. Psychopaths don't have that. They're doing things completely out of context, out of social context, and that's the problem. If we remove the definition of psychopath away from the, the kind of more clinical setting to an everyday life uh, kind of scenario, uh, psychopaths tend to have quite a few positive characteristics going for them. They tend to be assertive, uh, they don't procrastinate, uh, they uh, focus on the positives of situations, they don't take things personally, um, they don't beat themselves up when things go wrong. Another thing is the kind of the, oh, you're, you're not very susceptible to pain. It's the, the pain doesn't bother you. And also, when you're caught doing something, you have no tells. You could be caught red-handed, you know, having an affair with somebody. And you can say, no, that's not me. It's like, you're going to believe me or your lying eyes, you know, that's... And, and, and so it's this, uh, the ability to lie without any tells. Those kinds of characteristics um, can actually really help us get along in life. So let's, let's uh, give you a, a very simple example, if you like. The Nike slogan, just do it. There's a psychopathic slogan for you, if ever there was one. Psychopaths do not procrastinate. Psychopaths, if they want something, they go for it, and they go for it now. Top sportsmen um, are very high in certain psychopathic characteristics. Now, let me just go through them. You've got ruthlessness, you've got fearlessness, you've got mental toughness, you've got coolness under pressure, you've got the ability to focus remorselessly on a goal. I mean, these things are straight out of the sports psychology textbooks in many ways. So, you know, it, it, anyone from top golfers to, to top cyclists to top boxers, to top athletes, um, they are going to be high on these psychopathic characteristics. Usually the question is what percent do you think is due to genetics and what percent is due to environment? And it turns out not to be the great question to ask because the, it looks like the answer is if you are born with the biological markers for psychopathy, for example, that is the genetics and the altered brain pattern. Uh, early on, if you are a susceptible kid, then environment means everything. It means a lot, maybe 80%.